This is Viterbi Voices, your chance to hear stories about research, classes, student life, and more. Directly from our students, faculty, and other members of our engineering community. All right here at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Welcome back into Viterbi Voices. Here it is again, another bonus special episode, faculty roundtable edition. Uh, my name is Paul Ledesma, Director of Undergraduate Admission here at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And my name is Audrey Roberts. I'm a senior studying mechanical engineering here at USC. And as you already surmised, this faculty, special faculty roundtable edition is all about the Sunny Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at USC. We talk all about these two distinct disciplines in the same department, civil engineering and environmental engineering, plus all their different subdisciplines and specialization. So if you've been thinking about studying or you'd like to learn more about civil or environmental engineering, this faculty roundtable is all about the disciplines, all about the research, and it'll hopefully give you a much better view into the world of civil and environmental engineering. And with that, we'll get out of the way and hand it over to our faculty. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the USC Viterbi Civil and Environmental Engineering Department Faculty Roundtable. We have faculty from the Sunny Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering joining us. Um, my name is Paul Ledesma. I will be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, I am the Director of Undergraduate Admission at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. It's a pleasure to see all of you here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, a couple kind of ground rules for today's session. We're gonna go about an hour. Uh, and we're going to discuss the department, the discipline, the curriculum, our faculty, more about them and their research, and hopefully some of these fun questions that you guys have, have asked as well. Uh, and we're going to open it up to your questions and answers towards the latter half of the session. So please hold your questions for the time being. We will get to those questions at the end uh, and just hold those questions and we'll, we'll deal with Q&A at the end. But without further ado, we're going to allow our faculty to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves and, and where they come from and what they do at USC. We'll start with the department chair, Dr. Lucio Soiblin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. I am a, a professor and the chairman of the department. I uh, am originally from Brazil. I have my degrees, my undergrad degrees in uh, civil engineering from uh, a, a university in Brazil. Got my master's there, worked in Brazil in industry for 10 years and came many years ago to the US to do my, get my PhD. And I've been working in academia uh, since uh, I got my PhD at MIT. Uh, I focus my research on the interface of computing and civil engineering, working with uh, analytics and big data for better decisions and design and operations of civil and environmental engineering systems. Thank you, Dr. Kilders. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> All right, I'm Amy Childress, professor and director of environmental engineering. Uh, I'm from Maryland, went to University of Maryland undergrad, uh, got my PhD from UCLA, and uh, I research on membrane processes for wastewater reclamation and desalination. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Ben Weiss. Hi there, <clears throat> I'm George Bonweis, and um, I got my all my degrees actually from um, UC Berkeley. Um, I've been at USC since 2013, and my research focuses um, on climate and air pollution, and uh, have a focus on aerosols, particulate matter. It's been a really interesting time to be uh, an aerosol uh, researcher, given all the wildfires and the implications of aerosol transmission with COVID. So uh, it's it's been very interesting with, with aerosols probably being more in the news than ever before. Um, so we can talk more about that later. And last but not least. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Bora Gensturk. I'm an associate professor in, in the department and I'm also the director of our structures and Mateus Research Laboratory. Uh, my I was born and raised in Turkey. So my undergraduate degree is one of the um, uh, best engineering schools in Turkey, which is uh, Boğaziçi University. 
Then I moved to United States and got my master's and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urban and Champaign. And I was a professor at the University of Houston for five years uh, before joining to USC in 2016. So my research is mainly on construction materials. So I look at uh, high performance materials, mainly cementitious materials, uh, but also some metals. So we do a lot of materials and structural research, um, including durability of infrastructure, aging infrastructure um, at USC. All right, thank you, Dr. Genster, excuse me. Uh, we are excited to have all of you here today. We have a fantastic audience today, uh, all prospective uh, high school students and family members that are looking at this discipline as something that they might be applying this coming year for fall 2021. Uh, and thank you for sharing the, the, your poll answers with us today. It looks like a majority of you are in the Pacific time zone, but it looks like we're covered almost across the country and we have a few international students as well. Um, and we've listed out all the disciplines and it looks like some, there's some good balance between all the different disciplines, if you all can see that, uh, based on uh, what students wanna study. And we're gonna hit that question in just a minute. Uh, as far as what you wanna learn today, we're going to get into this type of information right off the bat. This helps guide our questions. Uh, and I love this fun question. So faculty, if you don't see that, be ready to answer this fun question at, at the back of the, the back session of this. Uh, but why don't we get started with uh, what seems like a simple question, but probably one of the most important for our students and parents in attendance, which is, what is civil engineering and what is environmental engineering? Maybe one of you can handle civil and another can handle environmental or please jump in. Another thing I'll say is go ahead and keep your mics unmuted if you're able to, because then you can keep talking over each other and that's always more fun. So I, I can start. Uh, I would start with civil and I would get Amy talking a little bit about the environmental side, but uh, civil engineer, it's uh, the professional that does uh, a lot of things related to the built environment, okay? So uh, uh, we go from the design and construction and operations of every systems that we, we interact in our daily life. So uh, buildings, it's one example, but when you think about transportation systems, uh, we go from the construction of the bridges, the pavements, the roads, but we design the time that it takes from red to green to yellow. You optimize those systems. So this is part of the civil engineering profession. We work with uh, soils, geotech, earthquakes. Uh, we, des we design uh, foundations of buildings to, uh, to deal with uh, extreme events, uh, with uh, hurricanes. Uh, 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 so uh, you have the water distribution systems, the civil engineer, it's responsible for building the water treatment plants, the physical part, and the environmental engineer, it's much more uh, responsible for how uh, w w w the civil, it's much more about the vessel and, uh, and uh, how you maintain and uh, transport the water, but the environmental engineering treats that water. So uh, uh, Almost everything that we interact in our life uh, has something related to one of the uh, expertises in civil engineering. Amy can add in the environmental side. Okay, so yeah, environmental engineering is the engineered side of processes, uh, maybe to remediate pollution, air or water pollution, but there's also a natural system side of um, of ensuring that the water quality or air quality that we're subject to is good. Um, and so at USC, you can either study environmental engineering kind of separately, or you can study environmental engineering within the civil engineering degree. Um, and I think that's kind of an, an important differentiation. If you like the infrastructure and the more systems approach, um, then environmental within the civil engineering degree could be better. If you're more interested in some of the basic sciences, the biology and the chemistry, then the uh, environmental route is a little bit more basic science versus, but there's still a very strong engineering component, um, but just not that civil infrastructure, large scale component of the civil engineering side. Did that make sense, George? Perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. I would. I would. Um, I don't. I don't think I have much to add. But but I. I do agree that um, environmental engineering. What I actually really like about it is that it's it straddles sort of understanding the systems, and so 
that means, you know, just understanding how the, the chemistry behind air pollution or the physics behind airflow um, or land air coupling, or, you know, there's, there's some sort of basic science to be understood, which then gets you to be able to find solutions to environmental problems. Um, and a lot of those are engineering solutions. And so you can sort of straddle the sort of more basic science, understanding the system and the engineering, finding solutions to the problems um, in, in, engineer, or in environmental engineering in general. And then, yeah, again, the, 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 the civil engineering degree with the environmental emphasis gives you more of that sort of infrastructure side of things as well. Although you still get a lot of, a lot of environmental engineering too. So uh, you guys, uh, uh, in the end, you sound very like our dean in, in engineering here that when he uses von Karman to explain the difference from uh, a statement from von Karman, uh, uh, explaining the difference from systems and uh, for science and engineering, that science described the world as it is, while the engineers decorate the world that never was. So you are more or less saying this in different words. Absolutely. Uh, so, Dr. Gensch, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask Bart to add any other uh, thing that I missed in, in the civil side. So maybe I, I may add that, you know, uh, one the other aspect that we also control is the processes, you know, we are involved in design, but also the processes such as the construction, Lucio, uh, for example, Dr. Sobelman works in the um, the construction management area, which has to do with the costing and all the, uh, you know, the construction sequences and the phasing. It's not just about designing the actual structure, but it's also about the the, the processes that gets involved in the, not just uh, in the construction process, but also beyond the construction and throughout the lifetime of the structure, we get involved when it is in you know, repairs and maintenance and, and all those things. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, also, um, if you all could please hold your questions for the time being, there will be plenty of time for Q&A toward the end, uh, but just hold those questions for now. Uh, I'd like to add a follow-up question for both Amy, uh, for Dr. Childress and, and Dr. Ben Weiss and, and the idea of environmental engineering. A lot of our students uh, are interested in things related to the environment and uh, maybe they've taken environmental science in high school and they see the opportunities to look at environmental engineering in college, but they also see other programs across universities that have the word environment in it, like environmental science or environmental policy. Can you talk about the differences between an environmental engineering degree program and something that's much more uh, outside of engineering? Sure, I'll let George start. <laughs> um, let's see, um, okay, so, I would say, you know, there are environmental engineering degrees, there are environmental science degrees, which are typically outside of engineering. Um, there is a program at USC that's environmental science. There's environmental studies, um, and then there can be other environmental degrees as well. Um, environmental engineering has, is generally speaking, the most technical of the degrees. So you're, you're going to be taking you know, um, physics and chemistry and math for your first couple of years and all of your engineering, well, not all, but most of your engineering classes are gonna be sort of building up your toolkit to be able to be employable as an environmental engineer. Um, environmental science, I would say that degree really varies depending on the university, um, but environmental science and environmental studies degrees tend to be a little bit more qualitative, I guess. Um, they can be really good programs, but the thing I think to look out for is to make sure that they're not closer to like a, a humanities degree, if what you want to do is technical stuff, um, because you you end up not learning the, the, the fundamentals and the building up, you know, your, your, your sort of technical knowledge to be able to do a technical job. Um, and so I would say that's the main difference, you know, and, and environmental engineering, at least in our program, um, again, what I like is you get the sort of basic science part, um, but then, and you also have engineering knowledge um, that you learn. And, and so I, 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 it's a little bit of a difficult question to, to answer because I think environmental science and environmental studies can widely vary depending on the university, but just um, look out for them being sort of not very, not technical enough if being technical is what you want. Nowhere near as technical as an engineering degree or creating of technology, I would say. 
And I would yep. add to that that in the environmental engineering program, George, you mentioned employability. We, we do not have any problem getting our students hired when they graduate. If they, most of them, well, I won't say most, I don't know the breakdown, but if they want to go straight into a position, we can, they easily can get a job. Um, if they want to go to grad school, that's fine too. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. But I can think we, employability, employee, oh my gosh, employability a bit. Oh my gosh, I still can't say it. That. <laughs> employability. <laughs> yeah, between say, between you and me, Amy, we can say everything. <laughs> I'll say that one. Employability. Okay. The marketability of the degree, uh, the opportunities for future employment uh, and salary, to be, to be quite honest with you. Um, so that, that's that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, can, can we expand a little bit more on the curriculum? Let's start with the undergraduate degree offerings, because there are a number of different degree offerings, and we've listed them in that poll for students to see. Um, can, we, can we describe the differences between these programs? Because we have some unique opportunities here for undergraduates. Well, uh, the curriculum, uh, one thing interesting is to talk a little bit before the curriculum, uh, it's to talk about the department. Uh, this is the department, this department is the department that has been changing very, very fast. I came here as chair in 2012, so uh, this is eight to nine years ago, and uh, uh, and we did hire, uh, now we are hiring another two faculty this year, even with the hire freeze. So we hired with everything around 12, uh, uh, 14 full-time faculty. And uh, we went last year through a huge exercise of uh, rethinking the curriculum because the world is changing, but because our faculty is younger with new ideas and you wanted to be able to optimize the curriculum to what you are really good at. So uh, uh, match the curriculum to the new amazing faculty that we hired and uh, uh, getting a, a younger perspective into civil engineering problems with the younger faculty and all the things that you have. Uh, the curriculum, when you see all those options, those are basically uh, small changes from one to the other one within the civil side, uh, the, all the options that you have, because uh, uh, the large majority of the first, second, and third year, the classes are almost the same. And what you have in the specialization, if it's structures or constructions, are a small number of classes that you take that would uh, put, give you a deeper knowledge in those specific areas. But the curriculum is, as George was saying, we are building the building blocks for the student to be able to uh, solve the problems that they're going to have. And then at the end, we introduce them to the types of problems in that each one of those specific areas. Uh, the only one that is a little bit more different is the building science curriculum. That's very unique to USC because building science is in hybrid with civil uh, engineering and architecture. So our students take the traditional curriculum civil engineering, but they have to take uh, around 12 units of classes in architecture on top of that with a complete different ways of content delivery that the architects do so well with the studios uh, uh, exercises, working the design. And, uh, and uh, so the students get a lot of interesting job offers because it's basically a professional that doesn't exist in the US. Companies really that the one they want someone with that specific expertise, they have USC to hire those students. Uh, but the others, yes, you have all those areas and I tell that the curriculum is not very different. It's uh, where you apply the building blocks that you learn during your first two, three years into the problems that you're going to try to use that knowledge to solve either in construction or in the structures and the other areas. In the environmental engineering side, uh, uh, in the civil engineering, environmental engineering and the environmental engineering, I would let uh, Amy or, and George talk about the curriculum. And then Bora, that it's a part of the curriculum committee can uh, talk a little bit more about the civil side. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not too sure what to add. I think I touched on it already with if you go the pure environmental engineering route, you get more of the 
um, chemistry, organic chemistry, but we've softened that. So it's not anything to avoid uh, biology. But if you go more the civil route, you get the underpinning and statics and, and some of the mechanics that I think is important for that infrastructure route. So there's a pretty, the first, I, for all of the programs, we try to keep the first year the same so that students can come in and have a little bit of movement if they decide where they came in is not the exact right program for them. Um, I don't know, Bora, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I may say a few things about the, the curriculum revision in the sense that what we, when we were working on this revision, we were focused on how we can introduce more and new things into the curriculum. And I think we have done a good job in that by removing some of the redundancies in, we have in the courses. So some redundancy is obviously good because you want to solidify certain concepts, but what we have done is that if there's too much redundancy, you know, repeating the same topic from one course to another course uh, over the many years, over the four years, uh, we remove those some of those redundancies. This allowed us to introduce newer concepts, more like research oriented things. And I think it gives the students a better perspective to understand the real world and what they could face when they graduate and go into their next uh, step in life, whether graduate school or, or uh, professional life. So I think that uh, we did a good job in that regard to introduce uh, other things, uh, other concepts into our courses. That's great. Can, can, can we flesh out a little bit more on the ideas uh, or on the balance of theoretical coursework and hands-on coursework uh, throughout the undergraduate curriculum? What's the department's approach and what are some projects that students can expect to find in their undergraduate years studying one of these disciplines? I would say, I would say that what you have, uh, uh, everything that it's design, uh, class as a title in design, we use uh, uh, top people from industry as uh, people from outside to help us teaching because bringing that experience in design is extremely important uh, to our students. So, uh, and those professors coming from industry where the students have, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that we, the academics, we provide the building blocks the mechanics, the statics, the, the, the chemistry, the biology, all the building blocks needed for the student to be able to solve the engineering problems. But when they are in the more, uh, the more senior years, when they are doing the capstone designs, when they are doing uh, the, the, uh, uh, the design uh, exercises, we bring people from industry to help them that have experience of doing this for many, many years. Other thing that we have, we have the concept that we call professors of practice. Uh, those are full-time professors that bring many, many years in the experience in the construction side. We have Hank Kaufman that owned the construction company for many, many years. And uh, he brings that expertise to the classroom. In the structure side, you have uh, 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 Greg Brando, that was the president of Brando, uh, uh, Johnson Brando, that's one, uh, probably the biggest structural engineering company in Southern California. Uh, so he, he's, he sold his, uh, his participation in the company and he provides full time to the department. We have Amy Richmacher with the Geotech. So we do uh, understand that uh, practical experience to teach uh, what happens in the industry. It's very, very important. And this is part of our curriculum. Our students being in a big city like LA, it's another big advantage of USC. If you compare it to universities in the middle of nowhere, that's very common to top engineering schools, uh, those state universities being those uh, college towns. Uh, we have a huge advantage that uh, we have LA around us. So the top engineering companies are uh, half of two miles away in downtown LA. So many of our students have a lot of opportunities for internship. And many of our students after the internships, even in their senior years, they keep uh, uh, partial jobs with those companies and uh, developing uh, uh, applications in the real world while they are learning the theory. Any other uh, ideas or, or uh, things related to hands-on projects that, that students might come to expect or that they that you go through that you know students are enjoying as favorites? 
We do, we ha in environmental engineering, we have a design course, like Lucio said, that um, is taught by somebody working in the field. And that's really great because then when they have opportunities for internships, they reach out to our students. And then when the students are looking for jobs, they obviously don't hire all of them, but they're willing to look at resumes and provide feedback. So it's a it's good connection to, to have. Yeah. So on, other, th other thing that you have that's pretty big at USC is the student clubs. Uh, for example, in the civil side, we have very active groups in the CMAA, Construction Management Association of America, that they have a huge competition that happens once a year in Reno, Nevada. And we send two buses of students to that competition. We send seven to eight teams there. And uh, those teams prepare a whole year for that competition. Normally, uh, their mentors, uh, normally not all their mentors are people from industry. That's what I tell that's an advantage of being in a big town. Uh, people are here, they, they come at, after their work, they mentor our students. Their objectives is to meet the top students to hire, but at the same time, our students are being mentored and trained, not just for classes, but to extracurricular activities while they go in those competitions. And they, they have a lot of interaction with the industry They're for competition, internships, we have so many options for those students related to get more practical experience. It's definitely a very tight knit community inside your department, the students, the faculty, the alumni, everybody seems to know each other, everybody works really closely together. And it, it just fosters a really nice community. And I think that's built out of the coursework, it's built out of the student design teams and, and student organizations. And then of course, that permeates their industry, you're absolutely right. Can, can we talk a little bit more about, uh, or switch gears a little bit more towards research? Uh, I know that there are some specific areas of research that are targeted in the department, but also I'd like to hear about individual uh, research uh, focuses for, from each of you. Okay, I can start with the four main areas that the department strategic planning and uh, where you, uh, the areas that you really uh, have a lot of uh, expertise and research. Uh, the first area, uh, it's the extreme events area. So BOR, it's a faculty work in that area. The extreme events looks into earthquakes, tsunamis, and uh, other extreme events, and uh, the, how we protect and uh, you understand how to build and design and, uh, and uh, fix things or, or, or deal with those events. This is uh, getting every year more important because the changing climate, those extreme events are getting more uh, common and they are getting more uh, severe. And uh, the way that we design our standards and uh, uh, the way that we consider the, uh, those events uh, affecting the infrastructure is now changing very, very fast. Uh, the second area that we have is the sustainability area. We have a lot of very strong work, both in the civil side and in the environmental side in sustainability. We have top work in air quality with George and Costas and others, but we have a, a very, very uh, strong uh, uh, sustainability work done in uh, water energy nexus and even in the civil and building with me and Burchin working energy on buildings, uh, improving energy efficiency a uh, lot of interesting work in this area. The third area is water, that Amy is in the water area. And, uh, and the idea is really drinking water. And uh, this is so important uh, uh, to deal in Southern California, wastewater and drinking water. Uh, uh, that is known to be one of the biggest problems that civilization is going to be facing in the next few years. And the final area, it's an area that it's very unique to USC that they will call it systems of systems. One thing that it's interesting in, uh, in, in civil engineering, it's that uh, we got uh, a specialized dividing ourselves in silos of expertise. So you have the transportation engineer, you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the construction engineer, you have the, the electrical engineer doing the grid, you got uh, designing those systems as independent. So you, the water distribution systems. So if you think in a city, uh, you people that design the water distribution systems to get water reaching your house, 
they optimize that system to 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 make sure that the water arrives in your house but uh, the people that do the transportation systems design the optimal system to allow you to drive and move in the city but they are designed as independent systems and they are not when you have a a, a, a water main break you a system a part of the water systems breaks you flood the highway so both systems stop operating at the same time so things are coupled and very complex and you really need to understand the interface of those systems and you have very strong group looking into complex cities, cities like la and how uh, you optimize the city as a whole but not the individual components of those systems uh, I will let them, they talk about their research. And if you have time, I talk about my research later. So uh, we can start with Amy talking about the water research. Okay, so uh, me, Dan McCurry and Adam Smith, that's two other faculty in kind of the environmental group. Uh, we work on the topic of water reuse, taking wastewater and essentially converting it to drinking water. Something we do a lot of in California, we do a lot of in Texas, but also on the East Coast, there's a big project, several projects in Virginia, other places. Um, and so we kind of come at it from different sides. I'm more of a process person. I'm, like I said before, a membrane person. Uh, Dan McCurry brings in the aquatic chemistry. So he quantifies the known contaminants in the water. And then he I tries to identify the unknown contaminants. And then uh, Adam Smith does more microbiology and um, biological processes, membrane bioreactors, that type of thing. So we kind of have a strong core in water reuse. I also do some desalination as well. And then I collaborate with Kelly Sanders. So Kelly does big picture energy water. And um, so her and I have had a few projects where we look at something called demand response for energy systems. So can our water treatment plants take up that additional energy when it's available? So we don't have to give it for free to Arizona or something. Um, and George, you also work with Kelly and do your own research. So maybe you can segue there. <clears throat> sure. Um so um, Kelly and I have co-advised a, a few PhD students. That, that work sort of brings together her energy expertise and my climate expertise. And we're looking at, um, in a nutshell, how climate change is, exp uh, is expected to increase residential energy use into the future. Um, we've done some other work that has used um, smart meter data. We got a really big smart meter data set for hundreds of thousands of homes in Southern California. And we're able to do a bunch of interesting analyses with those looking at things like um, developing a technique to determine who does and doesn't have air conditioning. Um, and so can I make connections. Sorry, you don't? Yeah, yeah, so, so make connections between, uh, you know, baseline climate, like if you live on the west side of the basin, you're less likely to have AC, but then also connections between um, various socioeconomic factors and air conditioning prevalence and then vulnerability to extreme heat into the future. So we've done some um, fun work on that. And then um, more generally, um, my research group focuses on various aspects of um, air pollution and climate change, which, you know, are, are two of society's big environmental challenges and so we we look at how climate and air quality and land cover interact at various scales um, look at neighborhood scale we do neighborhood scale studies most of what we do is urban scale studies but even some global global scale studies um, and then also do re so, so that's a little more on the fundamental side of things then also do research using what we learn about the fundamental things to to try to investigate sort of practical solutions for mitigating climate change and reducing um, air pollution in urban areas. So um, some, some examples are, well, something that we're working on now, I guess I'll, I'll describe what we're working on now and then a little bit about what we've done in the past. So um, now we're working on some studies to look at um, 
what are the air pollution co-benefits of various renewable energy pathways into the future, right? So as we adopt renewable energy, one of the main reasons for doing, doing so is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, which mitigates global climate change. But then there are huge air pollution impacts, like local urban air pollution impact uh, benefits as well. And so we're looking into quantifying um, those. Um, and then uh, we've done a bunch of work on um, what are called heat mitigation strategies. So looking at various ways in which cities can um, reduce temperatures in the face of urban heat islands and climate change into the future. Um, so I've done um, quite a bit of work on that using climate models and satellite observations and ground measurements and um, various, various tools. And then um, some work also looking at air pollution emissions, different air pollution emission sources. So we're just wrapping up a project now where we did a bunch of um, measurements down at the Port of LA to quantify um, some important sources down there um, of, of pollutants that hadn't been well quantified yet to try to help um, sort of target policies that would have the most effective um, air pollution reductions for the lowest cost, basically. Um, and so that's, th those are a few examples of the types of research that my group does. Dr. Genster. So yeah, I, I'm more on the structure side, materials and structures. So we have a bunch of faculty on the structure side. Um, I particularly uh, am more on the experimental side. So we have a, a, a decent uh, size uh, and, and a brand new structural testing lab, materials and structural. So I look at different construction materials, new and high performance construction materials, um, such as you know cr concretes that don't crack or concretes that go very high strength. Uh, we are doing work on uh, self-healing materials. These materials basically don't need any repair throughout their uh, lifetimes. Um, I, I, I involved and I still do that. Uh, unfortunately with the COVID, our lab has been closed for a while, but prior to that, and hopefully in the future, we uh, have a lot of undergraduate researchers uh, working in our lab. Uh, so I, I really enjoy working with undergraduate students in, in the lab and they learn a lot, I think. And um, and on uh, so my, my research is basically that uh, uh, in briefly, but there are other faculty members in our department who are also doing research on the structure side. Uh, Sami Masri, he is uh, mainly focusing on dynamics of structures. So he's uh, more on the earthquake side, looking at the dynamic vibrations of buildings and bridges. Similarly, Eric Johnson, uh, he's also our vice dean. Um, uh, he he's also has a similar research area where he looks at uh, dynamics of structures, developing theories for controlling and reducing vibrations during an earthquake, um, structural uh, damping systems, and, and so on. Uh, we also have uh, another faculty member, uh, Ro Roger Ganim. He's uh, he's also on the on the structures mechanics side. His research is mainly on the uh, probabilistic quantification of uh, processes and also um, mechanics, me probabilistic mechanics. He does a lot of research on uncertainty quantification and, and, and so on. Um, we have another faculty member, uh, his name is Kiming Wang, and he is he is at, uh, I think, in, in between the environmental engineering side and the and the materials. He's developing very interesting, uh, uh, basically, uh, sexual, uh, how, how to describe it, like uh, um, structural connections or, or 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 some materials that have special characteristics such as uh, uh, negative uh, thermal expansions and so on if you heat a material material will tend to expand the, the types of materials he's working on uh, you call them meta materials that basically shrink when you heat them and so on so he's also doing very interesting research uh, in, in those areas so it is uh, very briefly that's what uh, if you want to cover the research on the structure size that's what we do there's definitely a lot, and I'm sure we could spend a lot of time on that. Lucy, are you okay if we move on to another question? I think yes, sure. Okay. Um, so uh, in, in the areas of things that you all wanted to be answered, we covered practically everything. One thing that was on the topic was admission information, and we will not be covering admission information in this session because we have our faculty, and, they want, and it's great to hear from them. If you are interested in learning more about admission and the application process for undergraduate, for either first-year students or for transfer students, uh, I'm putting a link into the chat right now. Uh, where you can sign up for a specific session where we'll go over all of that information. So please find that, register for one of our information sessions, we'll be able to handle that. Um, the last thing that we didn't cover 
uh, is the the fun question. And so I'm going to ask you this fun question, everybody, uh, and then we'll get into Q&A from uh, all of our guests that are here. So if you weren't an engineering professor, what would you hope you would be doing for a living? Who would like to answer? George is the one that has a uh, dual life, so he can answer because he does dual. both. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That one's that one's easy for me. Um, I would be a musician, and um, so I, I play bass, and I, I would call I would call my bass playing semi professional. I I, pay, cool. I play show, I play shows. I get and I get paid for them. So that that's the definition of professional, right? Semi professional. Um, <laughs> Tell us the name of the people that you played with. Um, well, now now I'm playing in a band that's called Paco Versailles. Um, who the the guy who started that band is uh the same guy who started this band called capital cities which yeah. had a pretty big hit called safe and sound so huh? I, so that's a fun band to play with um and then i played uh, i played for seven years this is back when i lived in the bay area i played for seven years with in a in a jazz group with this guy mads tolling who is a two-time grammy award winning violinist um that's a few examples. That's fantastic. Very cool. So now, now me, Amy, and Bar, no I can cannot say anything. No, no, I cannot <laughs> top that anymore. Okay. <laughs> Any dream jobs from back in the day when you were kids about what you wanted to be? Truck driver. A truck driver. <laughs> Cashier. <laughs> <laughs> my my aspiration was to be a bus driver, Lucio. We're very similar. That was my yeah. favorite thing. Truck driver, or bus driver. Really? Those were both of your like aspirations. Well, when I was four, yes. <laughs> okay, it's just the big machinery, probably right. It's just out there like managing that big I, machine. I loved buses, yeah. and then I wanted when to I be an airline pilot. Yeah, even if I'm a civil engineer, when I was uh, 14 years old, my dad bought me two. Uh, army jeeps that would not operate and told me that I could make if I could make one of them I could drive them so uh, so well, 14 like years size, old full-size jeeps full-size jeeps I, I grabbed them and from the two I made one only things that he told me that I could buy was battery tires and uh, the carburetor everything oh, and the wiring everything else I had to uh, transform from the non-operating jeeps and make them work took Definitely. me one and a half one and a half year working and i had them when i was 15 and a half it was going and uh, but to drive in brazil you have to be 18 so i had that <laughs> thing for a while and could well, that drive definitely it. sounds like a mix between one of our engineering classes and one of these uh design competition shows like here are the rules you only get so many things you have to make it work yeah. Well, let's get to our Q&A. We have an audience with some questions here. Uh, and the first question is for Dr. Childress. Uh, and so I, I'd like her to answer is, how does it feel to be a woman in engineering? And what problems have you faced regarding the matter? Uh, and, and maybe you can speak not only to your experience, but to our, our current female students' experiences as well. See, I'd like to toss this one to George and let him start, but I guess I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that was only because you know if i want to think about something i've been talking yeah, no it, that's been your out for the whole session yeah. like george just kick it off and i'll clean it up yeah this one doesn't no doesn't. but but i can say something uh we our department uh the majority of the students in the department are female students mo <laughs> much more than 50 percent both in civil i think that uh the freshman class in civil was around 65 percent uh, female students and in environmental, uh, I'm not even going to say because it's 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 almost uh, too much <laughs> in the number. So it, it is an area, both civil and environmental engineering, that uh, uh, I don't see a, a lot of uh, resistance to women. You go in construction sites here in LA, top construction managers are women. I have three sisters older than me. They're all. Uh, uh, owners of construction companies uh, and uh, they, they never complained of issues and difficulties but I think that Amy if you live it and if you have anything you you, you, you can that, you, to that's good that gave me some time to think about it um things that like like you or like you're saying things are different definitely different now than they used to be um uh, but to be honest I don't I have not had a lot of challenges in that way um maybe 
in past more historic times. <laughs> um, there have been, but but recent, but in recent days, there's you know it, um, uh, we have three uh, female faculty in the department plus a couple more teaching faculty. Um, you hired so, another one now. Uh, yes, and we're in the process of hiring another one. That's good. So um, I feel uh, there are there are plenty of times that I leave the department or I leave environmental engineering and I'm in different settings. And um, I, I do still experience things sometimes in, in those different settings. But I'd say at USC and in general in the field of environmental and, and also in civil as well, um, it's maybe not such a big deal anymore. Yeah, there's def it's definitely a different world. Uh, and and uh, you know, school-wide, we, we reached gender parity last year in our incoming class this year. We were about 48% in our incoming class. And, and as, as Lucio noted, the incoming class for civil and environmental this year was, was a little more heavily tilted toward women. And it, and it kind of balances out each, each particular year. But we're, we're target for the school and our, our kind of operating structure is 50-50. Is so it's very different than a lot of other engineering uh, environments that are out there. Uh, Hope asked a question. It's a, little, it's a little wordy, so I'm going to read it out, and you guys can interpret it the best way to go. Uh, but she's, she's more interested in designing buildings and engineering while continuing in sustainable studies. Should I go into civil engineering with an environmental focus or civil engineering building science? Do you think I'll have broader or smaller, quote unquote, environmental engineering fieldwork in with a civil engineering building science degree? Yeah, so really, th this is a typical high school question, right? Um, there's so many options. I don't want to pigeonhole myself, but I have interests that overlap between these areas. What should I be doing? I, I would recommend building science because sure it's in, still around. Yeah. Yeah. I would recommend building sciences because there is a lot of sustainability in the faculty in building science. So they are doing a lot of sustainability work. And uh, because this is the one for designing buildings. If you are thinking about designing other systems like uh, water distribution systems, highway systems, then I would go with civil and with the environmental background. Depend what you want to design. If it's really focusing on buildings and green buildings and those kinds of things, I'd go to building science. And the advantage is that it's easier if you realize later that uh, that uh, it's not exactly what you wanted. It's easier to move from building sciences to back to civil or to environmental than the other way around because building science is the one that has this extra uh, criteria of classes uh, together with architecture. Yeah, I was about to say in, in the question, Hope, thank you for your question. You kind of answered in your first sentence saying, I want to design buildings. And so that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the answer to the question, what you yeah. want. Do. And, and this goes into another question that was asked by, by Caddy. Uh, it says, there's so many subfields. How do we decide which one is for us? And, and no one can tell you what it is that you want to do. And so when you hear the faculty talk, you'll notice there is a lot of overlapping areas. And, and how Dr. Soberman mentioned, they're, they're, they're coupled, they're interconnected, and it's complex. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, professionals in engineering even outside of this discipline, all work together to solve problems. So if you're confused, I would work more on the on the, the back end, reverse engineer. What what is the what is the problem you're looking to solve? What what's a passion of yours? What's what's interesting to you? And then start narrowing it down from that level. And then the link that I also put in our chat earlier about the disciplines, you can review the, the degree course outlines and, and see the differences in how the courses are taken and see which one might be right for you. Finally, yeah, but, well, sorry, but, but ju just to add something, I don't think that this is a very important and relevant question in the way that uh, uh, it's very easy to move uh, from one to the other one. So if we start, uh, and again, one thing that you have in your freshman year, it's freshman academy and introduction to civil engineering or introduction to environmental engineering. So you are going to be exposed uh, with much much bigger depth that you are doing here in one hour to what it's really all those sub areas and you can always move from one to another one. So uh, I, I, I would not be concerned now, I would be uh, arriving and talking and taking classes. Those things are going to, uh, to, and even later we have students that decide one area and then the first summer they go to internship and they come back and say, mm -mm. Not that <laughs> I want something else, or or, or 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 they were thinking one area, but by 
luck they got internship in another area and they realize I loved it. I, so it's very easy to move around and find your passion after you're here. That's exactly where I was going. So you read my mind. Yeah. You, in the admission process, you're not locking yourself in. Choose something that sounds interesting. You're, 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 it's a flexible program. You can change as you go. And, and engineering, and even with the, I think the main answer is it's an experiential process. You got to start going through it to figure out what you like, what you don't like. You can't figure it out from the outside looking in. Um, I'll let ask an interesting question is that, do you have any research going on related to the, the, the recent wildfires? Is there any research going on in that area related to civil and environmental engineering? We have one professor that has expertise in this area. Uh, he, uh, he, he's a tsunami professor, but he works at extreme events and he has been writing some interesting articles on, on fire. He's in, by coincidence that this year that they have all those fires, he's on sabbatical. But uh, in the last year when you had the fires and that it's happening every year, he did uh, work a little bit with some uh, agencies trying to predict, uh, to model uh, the path of those fires. So you know, he was using mathematical models to try, try to tell them which direction the fire was going to move. So we do have people working much more on the computational side on modeling those, the behaviors of those extreme events. Uh, and I, one, I can speak briefly too on, on the air pollution impacts of wildfire. Um, you know, both my group and another colleague, Costa Ciotis, we both work on a, a lot of things related to aerosol emissions and um, aerosol health. He works on aerosol health impacts. Um, one of my PhD students is just finishing a study. We we're looking at not this year, but the 2018 wildfires. And he did a bunch of measurements of wildfire um, emissions and basically using the measurements from wildfires that were in Southern California and also in Northern California, which we could detect um, all the way in Southern California. We did measurements off on a, a remote-ish island off the West Coast of LA, Catalina Island. Um, and, and basically uh, did a study looking at how aging of these wildfire aerosols affects their climate relevant properties. Um, so that's wildfire related. That's helpful. Thank you. I know, Dr. Childress, you're going to have to step out any minute now. Uh, and so feel free if you need to at any point. I know we're, we're running a little bit and we're going to start wrapping this up. I'm going to go through a few questions. Rapid fire, super fast. Uh, Daraja asks, how many students participate in research uh, or, and or internships through their undergrad experience? I've never known of, un of students that haven't had the opportunity to get involved in research if they wanted to. I'm, I'm assuming you all have undergrads involved at some level in your labs and you know of other faculty. Yes, yes. we not. Yeah. Yeah, we have more more option for research for undergrad students that undergrad students offering themselves to do research. You need so, more, uh, yeah. We need more undergrad students because as I said before, the city has all the industry and majority of these students are getting very interesting internships and uh, they uh, buy research internships. So many <laughs> choose internships and you, you have more positions for undergrad research than you have students wanting to do it. Absolutely. Um, what do you see the future of civil and environmental engineering going? I see it very clearly, but I'm talking too much. So anyone else wants to say it? Say anything? Uh, I'll, say, I'll say better integration between our natural systems and our engineered systems. Um, I think we might do more water treatment outside a building where with a fountain or things that you can see, not just tucked away in the basement of the building or, yeah. Maybe I can add extraterrestrial occupation. Like if we, if we were to, you know, build some bases in, in, on the moon or uh, travel to the Mars and, and so on, construction at those places, you know, civil engineers will be heavily involved, material scientists, construction materials, research and, uh, and you know, designing and building in those environments will be a completely different thing. You know, with the uh, the, the environmental conditions and the, the materials and so on. I think that's going to be a very interesting thing in the coming years. I, as I said before, I am a computing uh, in civil engineering guy. I see the AI and the change in the knowledge world uh, with a lot of work uh, moving from uh, uh, memorization and things that we know to that it can be replaced by computers to bring really the creativity and things that the computers cannot know, uh, ca cannot do it now. So uh, I, I really think that you're going to be working side by side with computers, 
big data and are going to be bringing the creativity to design those systems and uh, to operate those systems in a different way that you do today. Great. Um, let's go back to some of these questions as we wrap up. Uh, maker spaces. Uh, and I, I think I'll give a general answer related to the school, but I think you want to jump into. There are dozens of spaces that students have access to related to their design teams, also related to the classes that they take. Hands-on work will be permeated throughout your four years. And also we just finished building or finished building the first section of the brand new bomb maker family space uh which is their bomb family maker space which is actually pulling in lots of different teams into a full collaborative space so uh maker spaces have been at usc long before the term maker spaces was ever used it's just become very vogue now uh, and this are these are lab spaces and we have these everywhere and specifically in civil and environmental engineering there's a lot of stuff to do i mean i can think of environmental engineering taking up multiple floors in beagler hall we've got all of the structural labs uh down there in caprillion hall it's breaking stuff it's loud noises it's lots of cool things going on lots of machinery you've never seen anything you all want to add into that no we uh we we have both curriculum and extra curriculum activities that these students have to make things you have the ASC competitions, uh, the concrete canoe, the steel bridge that doesn't exist anymore because ASC had a, 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 an issue with that. But uh, uh, several of those competitions that you have teams of students participating and competing, you have a lot of hands-on labs classes. And at the same time, now you have uh, a lot of entrepreneurship and things that these students are uh, building two classes uh, using the make space. You have a class that it's very famous that we send our students uh, to uh, uh, Lesbo Island in Greece and these students were uh, uh, trying to build things to improve the life of refugees. So the, from those, I think that you have now from the last three years that you offered, offered that class, you have seven startups that started at the department. Uh, to improve the quality of life of refugees. So uh, uh, all these, these students build the prototypes and things with their own hands. So we need to wrap up because I know I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We're not going to be able to get all of these questions. Um, and so if you asked a question, you want to follow up with us via email, happy to help you. A couple of quick notes. Ashwini, your question related to uh, students and women of color. You should understand that we have actually brought in the most diverse class in the history of the engineering school this year, specifically historically minoritized uh, students in undergraduate engineering programs, Black, Latinx, and Native or Indigenous peoples are one of the highest numbers, uh, more than double most of the nationwide averages, 9% Black, 20% Latinx, 1.1% Native American. American. Uh, this is an incredibly important dynamic and diversity is key to our undergraduate student body. You can learn more about all this and more, especially a lot of these questions related to careers and career placement where our students are very successful, specifically in civil, and there isn't a harder or easier way to get a job based on one of these degree programs. At the end of the day, it's a civil engineering degree, it's an environmental engineering degree. Don't let the specializations trip you up anyway. Uh, that, those are just ways to kind of expand on your ideas and expand on your passions inside of the discipline. You don't change your job prospects necessarily because of that. So realize that students are successful in all of these programs. Uh, is there anything else you would all like to say before we wrap up uh, and then we can close it out? Oh, that I'm just looking forward to see you all in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely make sure you in watch. on campus not on zoom yeah let's get over this over the zoom stuff right yeah, <laughs> as quickly as possible i'd really like to do that uh but yeah don't forget to apply everybody the application process is open now and due by december 1st if you want to be considered for merit-based scholarships and all of you do so thank you so much for coming thank you dr childress thank you dr genstrick thank you dr van weiss and thank you dr swagelman we really appreciate you coming have a fantastic evening and now i'm going to go get some dinner ready with my family bye everybody bye, bye. Awesome, and we're back. Thanks for bringing us another uh, faculty roundtable, Paul. I think, um, especially with the civil and environmental engineering department, um, I think there's a lot of stuff that high school students tend to not know about this department because there are so many um, specializations, different majors in it, um, and there's a lot of super cool faculty. So I think this is a great episode. And we also, just to shout out some of our, our recent episodes, uh, looking at this major as well. We just had an episode with Concrete Canoe, which is a design team sort of under, under this major. So um, we have a lot of content out there to learn more about these majors. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time. We got more faculty episodes coming up very soon. Bye.